everyone. So what we're going to be talking about today is a little bit about the idea with IMS, which is Intermolecular Forces, and also dealing with um, what I call the pretty bitch problems, and also the phase change diagrams. So we're going to do a little bit of, of those today. The first thing we're starting off with is we're going to first talk about how no gas is ideal. Well, we just finished doing the ideal gas laws, and so now all of a sudden no gas is ideal? What? Well, the idea is that there really are attractions and there really are repulsions between these elements, these molecules. And so really no gas is ideal. And it says the attraction between molecules at actual volumes will cause deviations from the ideal gas law. And what ends up happening is gases may actually turn into a different form. Instead of being gases, they can turn into liquids. Good. The intermolecular forces, which are also just called the attractive forces, are small when the molecules are far apart. But when they're larger, they're, they end up being larger when the molecules are closer together. In other words, if you get two molecules that are close together, then that means that their forces of attraction are stronger. That's all that means. So it says, then what happens to the volume? If the molecules are closer together, then what's true of the volume of it? It's also going to be smaller. Yep, will decrease. Very good. The volume will decrease. Phase changes. So the problem is that they're called the gas laws, not the liquid laws, okay? So once it forms a liquid, the gas laws no longer apply. So if you're doing something like PV over T and you say, oh, well, when my pressure increases, my temperature increases, must have increased as well. Well, that's not true when you have liquids, okay? Same thing with pressure and volume being inversely related. So gas behavior at high pressure. If you get pressures greater than two atmosphere, so you increase pressure, increase pressure, increase pressure on a system, the molecules can eventually get so close together that they form liquids, good. And so PV equals a constant no longer applies. In other words, P1, V1 equals P2, V2 is no longer true. And the reason why is because your gas is being converted into a liquid. And with liquids, your volumes don't change. So with a gas, you can adjust the volume because we said that the volume of a gas is always just equal to the size of the what? Whatever the container is, perfect. So if you have a big container, if you have a really small container, that's the volume of your gas. But when it's a liquid, you can't change the volume of a liquid. You can take a liquid, you can put it into a huge jug, you can put it into a small vial. The volume of the liquid is always the same. If you have five milliliters, you still have five milliliters. And so that's why this no longer happens because if I were at one atmosphere and I had one liter here and I'm at two atmospheres, then my expectation would be that what would happen to my volume? So one times one is one, so two times what also equals one? Okay, but that's not the case here. If you have a liquid, then you this should be that, that P1, V1, that your liquid volume would actually stay the same. Well, then that doesn't work, okay? That's wrong. So if your volume is a liquid, then liquids don't change. Um, that's not going to adjust. So it says the pressure will remain at 9.8 atmospheres until all of your gas is converted into liquids. Liquids are incompressible. So as you increase your pressure, the volume actually remains the same. Therefore, PV will also increase, and so that no longer applies, just like we were saying. Melting point. So we know that the melting point is simply when you have a solid and your solid turns into liquid, then you have your melting point. So it's precisely the temperature at which a pure solid changes to a liquid at a given pressure. The molar heat of vaporization, or delta H vape, so it's your change in vaporization. So this is the energy required to, if you're vaporizing something, then what are you actually doing to the molecules to vaporize it? Separating. Separate. To separate, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is also equal to? One mole. One mole, good. Of any substance without changing the temperature. When water changes from liquid to gas at constant pressure, energy must be supplied, but the boiling temperature remains constant. So keep in mind that what we said, and we'll take a look at a, um, at a heating curve, but basically what happens is when you're going through a phase change, you increase temperature, increase temperature, and once you're at a phase change, your temperature actually remains constant, okay? And your temperature remains constant. I call it the Britney Spears effect. I say that she doesn't have enough energy to sing and dance at the same time, so same thing, there isn't enough energy to increase temperature and change phase. So what happens is you get a plateau, which is why if you were boiling water, the temperature would actually remain at 100 degrees Celsius until all of the water is completely boiled off, okay? 
So that's the, um, the idea of this. Delta H is measured in kilocalories per mole. What is a kilocalorie? So we know a calorie is the amount of heat that's needed to raise the temperature of, anybody know this? One gram of water by one degree Celsius. Good. And it is specific to water. So that's a little bit of review of calorimetry. It's important to know that a calorie, referring to the energy of food, is actually equal to 1,000 lowercase c calories, or a kilocalorie. To say that 10 grams of sugar has 41 calories means 10 grams of sugar did what to the kilocalories of heat when it's completely burned? So what has to happen if you're burning it, then what's happening to the energy? You're actually doing what? Releasing or absorbing energy? Releasing. Good. Um, releases 41 kilocalories of heat when it's burned. The delta H vape for water is 9.7 kcals per mole. So if you're vaporizing it, it says the same amount of energy is blank when gaseous molecules condense. If instead of heating it up and where you're supplying the energy and you're getting it to vaporize by getting it to boil, so you turn on the stove and you add the energy in, what if the reverse were happening and condensation was taking place? Then what would happen? Instead of energy being released, energy is now absorbed. Perfect. So the same amount of energy is actually absorbed when the molecules condense. Okay. So this is another reminder here. If you're going from, uh, if you need a freezer, for example, okay, so if a freezer would help, would help, like condensation, a freezer would help. We said that freezer, F-R-E-E-Z, is exothermic, okay? So if a freezer would help in a phase change, that's exothermic. Whereas if you have a stove, do you remember what that would be then? Stove would be endothermic, okay? But I want you to remember, that's only if your temperature is constant. That's only if you're at a phase change and your temperature is remaining constant, okay? So if you have a phase change where something is freezing or um, something, so versus if you have um, something melting, if something's melting, then a stove would help. That would be endothermic. I want you to keep in mind, if you take a thermometer and you put a thermometer into a solution and you start to dissolve something in water and your water temperature rises, what type of reaction was that? Exothermic. Why? Heat is being released. From the reaction, heat is being released. So you stick a thermometer in there and your temperature goes up. We said that's exothermic. So what would your sign of delta H be in that case? Negative. Perfect. Okay. If your temperature goes down, that's endothermic. But remember, in a phase change, your temperature is not changing. It's remaining constant. And so if it's remaining constant, you have to use a different thing. And that's where I use the stove and the freezer um, instead to try to remember that. Okay, it says for dinner you decide that you want to boil some potatoes. So you fill a pot with 250 mils of water, 250 grams. You got to watching friends, you never put the potatoes in, and all the water is evaporated. How much energy did it take to boil the water to dryness? And they're giving you your delta H of eight. They're also giving you grams. This is a review question. So what are we looking for? We're looking for how much energy, but that's not a unit. What unit would be... The, a good unit to use here that we're looking for? Kilocalories. Kilocalories. Because that energy is in kcals, let's use kcals. Okay? We've got two places to start. If you're ending with one unit, you should be starting, starting with one unit. So let's start with the 250 grams. And this is just water. It's H2O. So cross units opposite, grams. And where do we go from grams to moles? And water is 18.0 uh, or 18.012 uh, if you're using hydrogen as 1.02 grams per mole. And now I'm in moles, so now what can I use? Moles. moles to grams, and so how do I, uh, moles to what? Kilocalories. And how do I go moles to kilocalories? 9.70. Awesome. All right, so we're going to multiply and divide this. I get 134.57, 3, sig figs, so we're going to go 135 kcals is how much energy it took. Okay. And if it's delta H, then the question also would be if it's absorbed or is the energy being released? So if your energy is being absorbed or gained, then you would say positive. You're not being asked that. If the energy is being given off or released, it's negative. Boiling point. This is important that you understand that the boiling point definition is different from what you would expect. You would expect that it's just conversion from a liquid to a gas. It's the temperature at which you convert from a liquid to a gas. That's not the actual definition. It's the temperature at which the vapor pressure of your liquid is equal to 
or greater than, okay, but equal to is right where the point is, the pressure of the atmosphere above the liquid, okay? So what we say is boiling occurs when the vapor pressure is greater than or equal to the pressure of the atmosphere, or I say the pressure surrounding, okay? Whatever your pressure of your atmosphere, pressure surrounding, or maybe it's created in a vacuum, okay? Maybe there's some pressure that you've created in a vacuum. Then that's when you get boiling. So boiling happens as soon as your vapor pressure is greater than the surroundings. What's normal? Normal is when your pressure is actually equal, actually equal to what? Yeah, what standard pressure. So when it's equal to 1 atm, which is also equal to kPa, do you remember what it is in kPa? 101.3 kPa. What about in millimeters of mercury? 760 millimeters of mercury or tor. Good. So the normal boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. That's normal, okay? Be careful, so sometimes on a multiple choice question, it'll say which of the following is true. Normal boiling point of water is 100, but the boiling point of water is not 100. It doesn't, doesn't necessarily need to be. It's not always 100 degrees Celsius, but the normal one is, okay? Um, so it says if the pressure of the atmosphere is actually a little bit lower, if you have less pressure, then what happens to your boiling point if the pressure is lower? What happens to your boiling point? Why is it that it is less? Why is your boiling point lower when you have less pressure? It's easier for the molecules to what? To escape. If the molecules can escape easier, so if the pressure is less that's holding you together or holding any substance together inside of a beaker, once that pressure is less, those molecules can start to escape, and so they have an easier time escaping if that pressure surrounding them is less. So it says in order for a liquid to boil, the vapor pressure of the liquid must be equal to or greater than the pressure of the atmosphere, just like we said there. So that's the definition. Equilibrium vapor pressure is simply, so you see this word equilibrium, is the pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with its liquid. That's it. So you have your, uh, a pot, think of a pot that you've, you're boiling some water for pasta and you put the lid on, okay? If you put the lid on and you have a tight seal on the lid, then technically, you would never ever lose any water because what happens is it boils, it stays at whatever the temperature is of the boiling water, so 100 degrees Celsius if it's normal, okay? It boils, it recondenses. It boils, it recondenses. So when you lift off the lid, what do you notice? Condensation, right? You notice the steam and the condensation on the top. It wasn't there when you started, but it just will keep on cycling and you won't lose any water, okay? If that were the case, you would be at equilibrium. So equilibrium is when the pressure reading doesn't change with time for a liquid and its vapor. We know the word volatile. Volatility, liquids that evaporate readily with high vapor pressures. So there, if you have a non-volatile substance, it doesn't vaporize, okay? It actually stays like salt. You would call NaCl, you would call a non-volatile substance. Meaning, what happens when you have salt water and you boil all the water off? The salt's left behind. You actually get salt crystals inside of your pot left behind. Okay, to sum up, vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium. We talked about that. The vapor pressure of a liquid depends on two things. It depends on the nature of the liquid. And what else does it depend on? How do you know how much vapor you are going to have above the liquid? Well, it's called the vapor pressure. The what? Surrounding pressure. Surrounding, but that is the pressure. That's the vapor pressure. What does it depend on? Your temperature. Awesome. It depends on the nature of the liquid and the temperature. So as you increase your temperature, you're going to get more vapor, right? You're going to get more gas, more liquid converting into gas. And so it always depends on two things. Now, when we say the nature of the liquid, Anybody know what three letters I'm basically talking about when we're talking about the nature of the liquid? IMFs. IMFs. Perfect. The nature of the liquid means it's IMFs. Okay? So if you have a cup of water at room temperature, you have mercury in a thermometer at room temperature, and you have a tree at room temperature. All three of those, and maybe you have a, a balloon filled with helium gas. All of those are all in their phases, in that particular phase at room temperature, all because of their IMFs, okay? 
So when you talk about the nature of the liquid, it's just talking about just its intermolecular forces that it has. Because if it has stronger forces, then it's going to be harder to pull those molecules apart from each other. If it has weaker forces, then it's easier to pull those apart from each other. Okay, and is one temperature, at any one temperature, different liquids have different vapor pressure, so that's the case. And then as your temperature increases, what always happens to your vapor pressure for any liquid? It also increases. Very good. It also increases. All right, so now we're going to talk about the pretty bitch notes, okay? And so this stands for something. It's as in pretty female dog, so I'm not saying a bad word here, okay? And so um, what we're going to do is we're going to go through, and I've tried to come up with a way to be able to relate vapor pressure, boiling point, the rate of evaporation, the delta H of vape, all to each other, and so, and IMFs, all to each other, and so that was kind of the arrangement of the letters that, that actually was like the easiest one to remember, okay? So first thing it just says is that molar heat of vaporization or fusion is typically measured in kcals per mole, okay? And the second thing is energy can be used, can be measured in any of these. It can be joules, it can be kilojoules, it can be calories or kilocalories. And we already talked about exothermic and endothermic, so it depends on whether energy is absorbed or energy is being released, okay? So we're going to try to relate these. This P here actually stands for vapor pressure in my situation. So that stands for the vapor pressure, which again is the pressure of the gas above the liquid. RE is for the rate of evaporation. So how quickly is it evaporating? Okay, how quickly is it evaporating? Is your substance evaporating? But I have a line, okay? So that's my PRE in pretty. And those two go together, in other words. If my substance is evaporating at a fast rate, then I have a high vapor pressure because I have more gas above the liquid. So those are directly related to each other. Now these three are gonna be directly related to each other. The B is for boiling point. In other words, the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to or greater than the surrounding. I, which is for IMFs. And CH is delta H vape. In other words, it's the energy in order to vaporize. Okay, the energy to vaporize. So, the way that this works is, these three are directly related to each other. In other words, let's say that you have strong IMFs. You have a substance that is held together really tightly. Is that going to have a high boiling point or is it going to boil in low temperature? High. high. It's going to take a lot of energy to get it to boil, which means the energy to vaporize it will also be high. Again, strong IMFs held tightly together takes a lot of energy to be able to get it to boil, meaning that your boiling point will also be high. So you can see that if your IMFs are high or your boiling point is high, then your delta H vape is also high. But if you think about how fast it's evaporating, if it has strong IMFs and the molecule is held together tightly, is it going to be evaporating fast? No. no. So your rate of evaporation is actually going to be low in that case, and if it's evaporating at a slow rate, then it also has a low vapor pressure, or low vapor pressure, okay? So what you basically do is you figure, you can be told any one of these. If you're told one thing, and by being told one thing, you can figure out the other four. For example, let's say that I tell you that some substance A has a low boiling point and some substance B has a high boiling point. So what you're going to do is you're going to write P-R-E-B-I-C-H. And then you're going to put A on one side and B on the other side. And we said that A has a low boiling point, so I'm going to come over to boiling point and I'm going to say that A is low and B is high. So if this is low, then what about these? Oh, They're also low. And if this is high, then this is also high. And what do you know about these? It's the opposite. So if those are low, those are high. And if these are high, these are low. Now it doesn't take more than like, I don't know, that was probably 30 seconds, not even, to be able to do that. And once you have this, I can ask you any question. For example, I can say, which substance A or B has the stronger intermolecular forces, IMFs? B. Why? Because that's high for IMFs. Which one is evaporating at a faster rate, A or B? A. a. So it's circle A. Which one has a, uh, takes a less amount of energy to vaporize? In other words, the delta H vape is lower. A. a. Right there. Okay. So you can answer any of those questions just based on the one thing. 
and that's how that chart works. Okay, so let's come down to this chart just to try to make sure that we're okay with this. So we've got in this chart vapor pressures at various temperatures. So you can see temperatures increasing, going down, and we can see that we have four substances, different alcohols, butanol, methanol, propanol, and ethanol. And these here are what? Well, it doesn't tell us anywhere in this chart, but it does tell you right there. What are these representing? Vapor pressures, okay? So if you do a pretty bitch chart, P-R-E line B-I-C-H, then which one of these am I given? Am I given P-R-E, B-I, or C-H in this chart? Wrong. I'm not given delta H vape. What am I given? P. I'm given vapor pressure. Okay? So be careful with mixing that up. That's delta H vape. I don't know if I just misheard. That's vapor pressure is P. Okay? So you're being given the vapor pressures in this chart. It says it right at the top there. All right? So now the question is, do I have to write all four out? No. You're going to choose the high and the low. doesn't matter what temperature you look at. I just wouldn't look down here because I only have one. So it doesn't matter what temperature. Let's look at 10 degrees. What's my lowest one at 10 degrees? You know is my lowest. And what's my highest? Methanol is my highest. Look at any temperature and it should be the same. At 50 degrees Celsius, butanol is my lowest and methanol is my highest. At 80 degrees, butanol is my lowest and methanol is my highest. Again, that idea that as you increase temperature, no matter what, for every single liquid, your vapor pressure will also increase, okay? So now I'm going to write this based on just butanol and methanol. And I know that my vapor pressure for butanol was my low and my methanol was my high. So then that means that this is a low, which means the rest of these must be high. Oh, nice. And if this is high, then the rest of these are low. And then you would answer the questions, okay? The first question asked, what is the normal boiling point? Well, again, normal means that your pressure of your atmosphere is equal to what? 760. 760. One atmosphere, but this is not in atmospheres. <coughs> what do they say they're giving this to you in? Tor. Tor or millimeters of mercury. So we're talking about 760 millimeters of mercury. So where's the normal boiling point? Well, normal is when the pressure is equal to your pressure surrounding, which in this case is going to be 760. So let's look at butanol. Where, between what two temperatures will, will butanol be boiling? 100 and 110, perfect, because 760 would fall right into there. So that would be between 100 and 110 degrees. What about methanol, where would that fall? Good, there's 760 right between there. So if you come back, that's between 60 and 70 degrees Celsius. What about propanol? Yep, right there, 760 would fall there, so between 90 and 100 degrees Celsius. And what about ethanol? 70 and 80, and so again, that's where 760 would fall. Okay, which one has the strongest IMFs? So take a look at your pretty bitch chart, we're looking under the I, which one's the strongest? You know, which one's the weakest? The lowest is, we're talking about IMF, so right here, methanol. Which has the fastest rate of evaporation? So go to your rate of, ev of evaporation. Which one's fastest? Methanol. Which one has the highest delta H vape? Butanol. Very good. Each organic alcohol is placed in a flask and attached to a vacuum pump. If the pressure is reduced to 100 towards 60 degrees Celsius, which one's boiling? So let's come to 60 degrees Celsius. So we're looking right here at 60 degrees Celsius. Remember, by definition of boiling, Boiling is when your vapor pressure is greater than or equal to the pressure of the atmosphere or the pressure surrounding. So let's look at the chart at 60 degrees. And at 60 degrees Celsius, if your pressure is 100, which ones are, oops, which ones are boiling? All of them. Why? They're all above 100. Awesome. All of them. If the flask is cooled to 50 degrees, so now we're looking here at 50 degrees, now which ones are boiling? Methanol. Methanol and ethanol because those are the ones over 100. Methanol and <laughs> ethanol are the ones over 100. And
Pretty 